Um, our next speaker is Greg Erickson, joining us also in person today. Um, Greg, Greg has business offices in Juneau and in Bend, Oregon. Uh, Mr. Erickson's resume is many decades and 11 pages long, dense with positions, awards, and publications. He's taught graduate courses in economics at the university level, and he's held senior positions in corporate and government offices. He was the Alaska State Economist and co-founded and edited the Alaska Budget Report for decades. He's directed research studies and consulted on innumerable big industrial projects. And again, Greg Erickson clearly knows economics, but he's also been observant of the impacts of economic endeavors on human communities. So he's well equipped to help us understand the potential pros and cons of the project we're discussing tonight. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Greg Erickson. Thank you so much. Uh, that, that introduction proves one thing, it proves I'm old. Been, have been around a long time and seen quite a bit. That doesn't mean I know very much, but this is the best I can give you. What was I asked to do to provide the Haynes community, you folks, with um, credible and unbiased information on the economic considerations in financing, repair, reconstruction, or replacement of the Haynes Lutec dock? But what is the real issue? Um, there's lots of ways to frame this question and how it's framed makes a big difference. The best is, it, is, is are we gonna frame the question as the best way to maintain and improve marine freight access? Or as some might see it, how best to encourage new mining developments. And those are only two of many different ways of framing the question. But the issue that brings me here today, or that uh, induced the Lynn Canal Conservation Group to ask me to come today, is that Ada is, oh, this is a quote from uh, your great radio station here, uh, KHNS, um, uh, just to say it as an aside, I have grandchildren in, in Missoula, Montana, and Portland, Oregon, and Ketchikan, and Juneau, and I'm familiar with the media situation in all of those communities, and I can tell you that your um, access to quality information that's relevant is far better here in Haines than it is in Portland, or Missoula, or in Bend, where I spend most of my time. And you're very lucky, and I hope you continue to support the Chilkat Valley News and KHNS. This is a headline from KHNS. Um, I put a little asterisk in there on the, on the phrase new one because it's really not a new uh, ore terminal, it's an old one. In fact, it was this built in 1968 and by Ada's own um, admission to the Skagway uh, Borough Assembly, it's obsolescent or obsolete. Uh, what they're proposing to do is disassemble it and bring it to Haynes or, and I say proposing, it, it, it's a very amorphous project uh, and a very amorphous uh, idea that is behind all this. We, we don't really know what it is they're trying to do. Although, as I'll get to later, I think we have some sense of why they're uh, doing it or raising this proposal in the way that they are. Um, as we all know, the, there has been a number of engineering studies, and I'm not certain, certainly no engineering, but, uh, but I read the studies, and they suggest that the uh, LUTAC dock is uh, about ready to have a catastrophic failure. Uh, the study that I read was from 2014, I think, and uh, I guess it hasn't failed yet. Um, the um, conventional wisdom, anyhow, is that the, it's going to cost millions of dollars to fix this dock, and if you don't fix the dock, well, you'll be cut off. But I think it's clear. Uh, I, I, I think there's other options 
for maintaining marine freight access to Haines uh, that haven't been perhaps as explored as well as they might have been. But some see uh, investment from ADA as a way to save this critical piece of infrastructure. Um, and under the plan, as at least it's been described on, by the news media, is that Haynes would accept a low interest loan from ADA and the loan would pay for repair of the Lutak dock and pay for moving the ore loading facility to Haynes. And dock user fees would pay this all off and everybody would be happy. But as Guy has pointed out, there are tremendous uncertainties associated with this whole idea, not just the kinds that, that uh, Guy was talking about, but uncertainties that you normally wouldn't encounter in this kind of situation, like how much would Haynes borrow? I mean, I don't, I've heard the figure 30 million tossed around, but I haven't seen a written document from ADA or, that uh, suggests that that's what it would cost. What's the interest rate gonna be? These are economic questions that are real important if you're making a decision to go into Hawk for $30 million or any large amount. I've heard three and a half percent, but I haven't seen that in writing except in a news story. Why would ADA be seeking a new home for its Skagway ore loading facility? And what is the chance the ore loading facility would pay for itself, which is basically the idea that they're, that is trying to be sold or that is uh, being brooded about. Well, as I mentioned, we're talking about 30 million, maybe. We're talking about three and a half percent, maybe. And what does Haynes supposed to get for this? Well, a skookum dock and, and, and a big mine. That's sort of what they're saying. Um, but again, it's really hard to find any place where ADA, at least, the agency that seems to be behind this proposal, has uh, put those ideas in writing. Why? Let's go to these questions. Why is ADA seeking a new home for its uh, Skagway ore facility? Well, as uh, Guy said, their lease expires in 2023. Um, right now, they're carrying that lease on their balance sheet at uh, a very substantial amount. I don't know the exact amount, but I think it's probably seven and a half million dollars. If they can't find a home for that lease, they have to take a hit on their balance sheet of seven and a half million dollars. And suddenly when they disassemble that facility, if they can't sell it or move it to, to Haynes or somewhere else that, that can be usefully employed, they're suddenly seven and a half million dollars poor. And that's real important to them. Um, and I think is that, that's why they, their chief revenue officer is one of the people who's sort of been the point at, ADA's, uh, at ADA for uh, providing information about this. Um, another factor is that Skagway is, is uh, really reluctant to um, uh, renew the lease. Um, and um, Skagway's concerns are, uh, they've got a lot of concerns in Skagway. Um, Ada has adamantly refused to accept any liability for the pollution related to the ore loading operations, kind of pollution that Guy was talking about. Um, and they, they simply say, hey, we've managed this port in accordance with the DEC and EPA regulations. We have always uh, met those requirements. Uh, if there's any pollution, it's not because of us. In fact, the cleanup of the pollution, which is demonstrated conclusively, is undoubtedly going to be the subject of a great deal of litigation. And Ada is undoubtedly going to be part of that litigation. They're going to be sued and they may sue others. And um, it's, it's not clear how that will come out, but it's clear that Ada doesn't want to, at this moment, suggest that they had anything to do with it. I think that was a foolish decision on Ada's part, but uh, that's the way they're operating. Um, Skagway has a very 
limited shoreline that's suitable for um, port facilities. And the ore facility takes up a really big footprint. And that footprint um, is, uh, is uh, creating safety hazards. The Southeast Alaska Pilot Association and the Coast Guard have said that uh, as cruise ship um, uh, dockings occur more frequently, there's more and more situations where unsafe uh, situations develop in terms of conflicts between uh, loading freight and the cruise ships. So you can't do them both at the same time. And that's undoubtedly going to become more frequent because the um, freight loading that occurs, not of ore, but of containers, for example, um, that occurs on the uh, footprint of the ore loading facility are um, going to be disrupted. And um, it, from Skagway's point of view, the cruise ships are the big money item that benefits businesses in Skagway more than um, anything that occurs at the ore loading facility. So that's an issue. And Ada has adamantly refused to renegotiate the lease that would change the footprint or um, adjust those problems in any material way. Um, but let's suppose that the ore loading facility is dismantled. And let's suppose it is moved to, Skag uh, to Haines and that it's erected here. And what's the chance that it'll be a, a paying operation, um, that it will pay for itself? Well, Ada's, at that time, development officer in 2018, made this statement, and I put it up verbatim. We have had no contact from any mine in recent years that have expressed an interest in using the ore terminal. What we, we do not think it is a viable business. That would, there is a viable business that would lease space in that, in the terminal. Now that was made in 2018. And of course, Haynes is different from Skagway there. Haynes doesn't, has a potential Constantine Palmer mine uh, that wouldn't affect, that wouldn't be a prospect for Skagway. But still, I think you'll hear later in, in the program that uh, the chances are very high that uh, any mining development in the Yukon or here that would use that facility are um, problematic. Um, let's look a little bit at the history of these kinds of projects in Alaska. Um, there was a movie some years ago about a baseball oriented movie that uh, had the phrase, build it and they will come. And that, that, that idea has a long history in Alaska. The belief that infrastructure, like a port, equals economic development. Uh, a disregard for any rigorous analysis of economic feasibility and a political influence by public and private parties with vested interests. For example, Ada's interest in protecting their balance sheet. Hmm. I think we need some technical assistance here. <laughs> Not going forward, yeah. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, the uh, it's no secret that Alaska has had the sad, sad legacy of failed and near-field projects. That was a statement by the um, representative of the Alaska Support Industry Alliance, a, uh, a petroleum-oriented, a group of petroleum-oriented uh, support companies in, uh, in Alaska. It's a public, it's, it's an open secret. 
Um, and port projects have been particularly problematic. Uh, you go back into the 50s, for example, uh, look at the Cape Thompson Harbor project. There's a huge coal uh, seam prospect uh, in Northwest Alaska. And the Atomic Energy Commission was trying to uh, promote the idea that a uh, nuclear device could be used to excavate a huge port in Northwest Alaska. And they said, let's just bury this atomic bomb and blow a huge crater and the water will flow in and we'll have the ideal situation to export that coal. That uh, didn't happen, of course. Um, the next big project was one of the few successes, or at least successes in quotes, the Long Mountain Transportation System. I was working for the legislature um, at the time it was being considered in the, in the uh, 70s, uh, early 80s, and um, every high-class lobbyist that I was aware of, or competent lobbyists that I was aware of, and some that weren't so competent, was hired to support the state participation in financing this huge transportation system. It's a big copper deposit. It's located quite some distance from, from Tidewater and the uh, developer and the landowner, which was a native corporation, Nana Corporation, really wanted the state to build that transportation system. So they built the road and the port, and here's a picture of it. Well, that's Cape Thompson, a bleak and <laughs> forbidding place to build anything. Um, oh, where's the, there we go. There's the, the long, a picture of the actual facility that was actually built and was and currently is in operation. It's had some major pollution problems and a lot of the, the same sorts of things that Guy was talking about, dust flying off of the trucks and they've had to make no modifications, but at least that's the one port project that is still in operation and actually did get completed and where the bonds were largely paid off. Nope. Then let's take the, the Seward grain terminal and the Valdez grain terminal. Maybe some of you who are longtime residents of Alaska will remember the Hammond administration uh, and uh, had a uh, fellow by the name of Bob Palmer, who was a very strong advocate for agricultural development in Alaska. And they, they developed a, uh, at least what was called agricultural land in the interior of Alaska near Delta for um, growing grain. But they needed like the Red Dog, like the DeLong transportation system, they needed facilities to get infrastructure to get that uh, to its market, <laughs> primarily in, in Asia. And um, invested uh, close to $12 million, which in the, time that that occurred in the late 70s and early 80s was uh, a lot of money. And the Sheffield administration came in and decided it was in, wasn't a winner and it was somebody else's winner if it was a winner and they canceled that. But Valdez had always wanted to, and saw that the decision to put that grain terminal in Seward was a big mistake. They wanted the grain terminal and the people of Valdez were convinced to approve a $10 million bond issue to build their own grain terminal after the Sheffield administration canceled the terminal in, uh, in Seward. They built it, and this is a picture of it. It has never shipped a bushel of grain anywhere. Um, and that's what I'm going to leave you with. I think Guy's talk about uncertainty is very apropos. There is a lot of risk involved. And while the, it is possible that improvements to the LUTAC dock are absolutely essential and that there are no alternatives, still, I think it's important that the people of Haines 
carefully think about undertaking a large obligation for benefits that are certainly far from certain. Thanks.